So we're going to take a break from our current message series, and I want to talk about our business meeting last Sunday and the events leading up to it as our message today. I've been pastor of Lakeland, now Livingstone's Church, for 19 years, and I believe that we may be experiencing the f a first in the life of our church. Now, like every church, from time to time, we have various levels of, of conflict, and we resolve those conflicts. But I believe that for the first time in our history, we may actually be facing division in our church, or certainly the strong potential for division in our church. And unfortunately, this is not necessarily all that unusual in churches. People have differences of opinions, and those differences lead to certain thoughts and attitudes and actions that ultimately lead to division. And the question is, okay, what do we do about that? Or, or how do we go forward in light of this, this potential that we have here in our church? And, and I believe that Paul's letters to the Corinthians can really help us here. And there's several things about the Corinthian church that I want to point out. And the first one is that the Corinthian church was a great church. In fact, if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to turn to 1 Corinthians. And I'm going to be in chapter 1, starting in verse 9. And Paul writes, I always thank God for you because of His grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in Him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because of our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. And so what we have here is Paul is thanking God for the Corinthian church. And he's thanking God for the very existence for their salvation, for their spirituality, for their relationship with God, and for their impact on their community. And I want you to notice that all of these things are a function of their relationship with Christ. He talks about their salvation, the grace that God has given them, which is a function of the cross of Christ. He talks about their speaking, which is their preaching, their teaching, their evangelism, and how all of these things are in Christ. He talks about their knowledge, which is the spiritual wisdom they have, their doctrine, their theology, and how these things are in Christ. He talks about their spiritual gifts, which are you know, their ministry in the community, the, the, you know, the kingdom impact that their church is having, the various kingdom ministries they are having, and how those things are in Christ. He talks about their strength, their fellowship, and and their hope, and how all these things likewise are in Christ. And so every good thing about the Corinthian church is in and through Christ. And I believe this is true of every good church, of any church that's doing anything. Anything good about that church is because of Christ working in and through that particular church. And I think that's true of our church as well. And to the extent that we allow Christ to work in and through us, we are a great church. And personally, I do believe that we are a great church. And those of you who know this church and love this church understand exactly what I'm talking about. I remember a meeting with, with Randy, Pastor Randy, uh, a couple of years ago, prior to he and his family visiting Living Stones. And we met at O'Charlie's because he loves O'Charlie's, and it was Free Pie Wednesday, and Randy has a particular affinity for Free Pie Wednesday. And so we're hanging out, and he asked me a question. He said, I want you to tell me about Living Stones. Tell me about the quality of the church, the personality of the church. And the first thing I said is, our church is unified. Our church doesn't have any agendas, any divisions. Everybody just you know, loves one another, and we just have this rich community. That's, that's really awesome. And I talked about how our church has this really sweet spirit and how we care about one another and how we're there for one another. And when something happens or there's a need, you know, there are people there to meet that need. I talked about how our church has a hunger for God's Word and a love of God's Word and how we want to go deep and we want to understand the Scriptures. And finally, I talked about our kingdom impact. And in particular, 
with our, our international missions and how historically we've been involved in a lot of different countries and different mission partnerships. And now, of course, we have the pastor training school. And I'll tell you, it's really interesting, and I've said this before, everywhere I go, People ask me, how are you able to do this? How are you able to come and spend all this time with us and teach pastors and do these things? And I always tell them it's because of a very unusual church, a, a small church in Cumming, Georgia, that allows their pastor to go out and, and do these things. And so our church in all of these ways is a really great church. And I hope that you understand that all of this isn't because of how inherently awesome we are. That all of this is true because Christ is working in and through us. And, and I know that we appreciate that. I know that, that we're thankful, like Paul is thankful for the church in Corinth, for the, the church here at Living Stones. Because a couple of years ago, a couple of churches approached us about merging and coming together. And we resisted that. We didn't want to do it. Because we understood that we had a very unique culture, a very unique fellowship. And we appreciate that so much that we didn't want to risk it and we didn't want to go forward. And so that's the Corinthian church as well, as well as our church. I think we're you know, great churches in that regard in that God is working in and through us. The Corinthian church was also a very human church. It was a church, honestly, that, that had some problems. And the first problem they had was it was a divided church. In chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, we read, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another, so that there may be no divisions among you, and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another I follow Apollos, another I follow Cephas, who is Peter, and still another I follow Christ. They were also an immoral church. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 and 2. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that does not even occur even among pagans. A man has his father's wife, and you are proud. They were also an inconsiderate church, or a a classist church, or a church that did not always respect one another. There wasn't a strong fellowship in that way in the church. 1 Corinthians 11, 20 and 22. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. Or one remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. Now, I think it's important for me to state that there's no such thing as a problem-free church. Because every church, in essence, is a human church. And as human beings, we are incomplete. We are sinful. We are imperfect. And so each and every one of us is fully capable of dishonoring Christ and his body with various thoughts and attitudes and actions. And like the Corinthian church, Living Stones is also a very human church. And like the Corinthian church, we now find ourselves with division or at least potential division in our church. And I do want to, from a bird's eye view and from my perspective, share just a little bit of an overview about kind of what's going on and, and how we got to this place. So, a while back, I put in my resignation and set some dates for that uh, resignation. And we got a search team together to call a pastor, and our associate pastor, Randy Grimes, submitted himself as a candidate. And I, I want to stop here and, and say that I think Randy's a fine candidate, and when anybody comes and talks to me about him and, you know, what do you think about Randy? I always say the exact same thing, and I believe it with all my heart. And that is that no one has earned the right more than Randy to be considered. I believe that he is a tireless servant who has invested in countless people in and outside of the church. I believe he's brought an incredible passion and energy to our church. 
And this is obvious in many areas, not the least of which are prayer ministry and local missions. And I don't know anyone who disagrees with that. I don't know anyone who thinks that Randy isn't doing a great job. And so naturally, there are people who love Randy and want to support Randy and think that Randy will make an outstanding lead pastor. And there are others in the church who believe that perhaps maybe he's not the best lead pastor. And listen, there's nothing wrong with disagreeing about something. It's not immoral, it's not wrong, it's not ungodly to have differences of opinion. Where it goes wrong is when those differences lead to various thoughts, attitudes, and actions. And these occur when we assume the worst about people. When we assume people's intent or motives. When we read into words and actions. When we respond in unrighteous ways by jumping to conclusions and making accusations and not taking the time to understand someone else and going to them and seeking their perspective. When all of a sudden it becomes a contest in, in which we seek to win. And if everybody's doing those things, the cracks in our fellowship become canyons in our fellowship. And so we have some people on our search team who felt very strongly about Randy's candidacy. And we have some people on the search team that didn't feel as strongly about Randy's candidacy. And that led to some confusion and some division on the search team. And I have not been involved with the process and have tried to remain outside of the process. But when I found out there was division, I wanted to get involved and try to bring about some unity. And so I interviewed every member of the search team and I found out that yes, there is confusion and, and really the idea of an internal candidate and not knowing what to do about that. And so I called our associational missionary, Alan Morris, who is responsible for for overseeing these kind of things. This is part of his training, and it's one of the most important, if not the most important thing that he does for our churches, is he helps churches in the pastoral transition. And he informed me that when we have internal candidates, that it's best to consider them first, because this sort of thing is, is very likely to happen. In fact, almost certain to happen uh, with internal candidates, and especially if you do not consider them first. And so... I immediately went to the, the moderator of our business team because they were personnel. I went to our chairman of deacons, and I shared this information with them. And I said, I think we need to consider giving a new charge, new directions to our search team that they need to consider the internal candidate before they consider the external candidate. And the deacons and the business team agreed with that unanimously, and they decided we needed to bring that to the church for a vote. And... That's because the church is the one who gave the instructions to the search team initially, which did not include separating internal and external candidates, that there was a charge just to con consider all the candidates together. And so now we were going to change that process, so the church needed to be involved in making that decision. And so that was the business meeting that was supposed to happen on Sunday. Also, I wrote the motion, and I wrote the motion knowing there were some differences on the search team, and so the motion called for a simple majority from the pastor search team. Now, it is normally customary for search teams to be unanimous, but I knew what was going on with the dynamic, and I wanted to give Randy every opportunity. And so in the motion, I made it a simple majority on the search team to present a candidate to the church for an internal candidate. Well, we got into the business meeting, and some folks question that. And some motions were made and then more motions were made about the threshold of what percentage of the search team needs to be able to put a candidate forward. And then I was asked whether I would consider if the, you know, staying longer, if the church invited me to stay longer, if I would be open to that. And honestly, I didn't want to deal with that at the time. I wanted to try and get this whole situation kind of behind us and remedied before that discussion ever came up. But I said that I was, you know, if the church, you know, asked me and needed me, of course, I would be open to entertaining that. And then things really kind of got crazy. And, and Randy withdrew his candidacy because he saw disunity. And he saw the tension in the group and kind of what was going on. And so there's been some fallout to the, to the meeting. Prior to the meeting, there were those who... who 
were upset because they felt like some people were trying to install Randy and kind of bypass the process to kind of bring him to the church. And, and then after the meeting, there were people who were upset because they felt like Randy wasn't treated fairly. He wasn't given a fair opportunity, and he wasn't treated with respect and honor, and he certainly earned that, and he's deserved that through his service in our church. And, and I've even heard from, from some people that some are saying, you know, hey, I'm for, for Randy, or I'm, I'm for Gary. And listen, I get that. You know, I've been pastor here for 19 years, and a lot of people have come because they know me, they like me, they like my style of preaching, and they want to be supportive of me. And Randy's really been here front and center for the last year and a half, and he's invested in a lot of people, and he's awesome at pastoral care, and he's, he's really drawn close to people, and they want to support him. And so now, here we are. And honestly, probably 90 to 95% of the church is not directly involved in all of this, but there's a potential for people to, to be drawn into this and to take sides and all that. And that's really what I think we need to prevent and, and step back and take a deep breath and, and ask ourselves, how do we approach this situation in a biblical way, in a godly way, in a spiritual way, and in a way that absolutely honors Christ. Because just like the Corinthian church, we are a very human church. And so because of that, we have now found ourselves at this place where if it's not division, there's a potential for it. So that church is, a, the Corinthian church is a great church. It's a human church, but it was also a healing church. I don't know if you know this about the Corinthian church, but Paul actually wrote four letters to them. We only have two of them, but two other letters are alluded to in the other Corinthian letters. And all of the letters were responding to pretty much this issue, the division within the church. And so it took time to work that out, but eventually they got it. And in these letters, the two that we have, we have Paul's prescription for how to approach such things. Or there's advice in there for what to do when we're facing division. And I just want to share those with you. The first is that we have to understand that Living Stones is not my church, it's not Randy's church, it's, it's not even necessarily your church in, in a technical sense. It's God's church. The church belongs to Him. And this is the first thing that Paul points out in 1 Corinthians 1. Starting in verse 12, one of you says, I follow Paul, another I follow Apollos, another I follow Cephas, still another I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I'm thankful that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so no one can say that you were baptized into my name. Guys, this church never was and never will be about me. Never was and never will be about Randy or anybody else. It was and is and always will be about Christ and about us following Christ. The interesting thing about this, and, and Paul's point here, is this is exactly who we are as a church. Or what we've tried to be as a church over the last 10 years. Our actual mission statement is to be a Christ-centered church. And that's the advice that Paul has given and you say, well, you know, what exactly does that mean? What does it mean to be a Christ-centered church? We'll just go into our lobby and look at the poster. To know Christ as true worshipers, seek Christ as true disciples, and serve Christ as true missionaries. And that needs to be front and center. That needs to be our focus. And we need to be unified on that, unified around Christ and who He wants our church to be. And the rest will take care of itself. And fellowship will take care of itself. But as long as man is first, as long as Gary's first, or as long as Randy's first, or anybody else is first, then we're going to have a really hard time being a Christ-centered church. In fact, it's impossible. Christ has to be first in our midst. The second piece of advice that, that Paul gives to the Corinthians is found in chapter 11. And it's concerning division in the church. And, and Paul puts all of it in the context of the Lord's Supper. And the idea is, is that the church and the members of the church should always reflect Christ. You know, they should reflect His goodness, His grace, His peace, His, his mercy, His forgiveness, His righteousness, His holiness, all of that. And 
the final thing that they ought to reflect is unity, the unity of Christ, which we know is important to Christ because it was the subject of his priestly prayer. And so Paul is responding to division using the Lord's Supper as an illustration. And this is what he says starting in chapter 11, verse 27. He said, Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. And he's speaking specifically about division. He's talking specifically about those who are not treating others in the way that they're supposed to, about brokenness in the church, about the need for reconciliation. And he's saying, we can't have fellowship. We can't have the Lord's Supper, which symbolizes unity, unless we have unity in the body, unless we are reconciled to one another. And so the key here that Paul gives us is that we ought to examine ourselves and not necessarily our brother, that our responsibility is with us to examine our thoughts, our attitudes, and our actions that may have contributed to whatever situation or whatever conflict that we find ourselves in. And as we take responsibility for ourselves, we let God worry about our brothers. Now, I just want to be really honest with you. I have agonized over this situation. The last four to six weeks or however long it's been that we've been trying to work through this, has, has been incredibly difficult. It's been a very heart-wrenching time for me. And some have suggested that, that you know, possibly I mismanaged the process or, or there were other you know, things going on. And every time somebody says something like that, I really internalize that and I really think about that quite a bit. And so there have been some things, that, some conclusions that I've come to. And so the question is, man, I, you know, would you have done some things differently? And absolutely, I would have done some things very, very differently. I would have approached this whole thing in a whole different way. Again, I didn't do anything you know, intentionally to, uh, to lead us to where we are. But you know, there's a couple of things I really wish I would have done different. The first one is about the idea of considering internal candidates first. I'll be honest with you, I just missed that. I didn't know it. I didn't know that's the way things were supposed to be. And, uh, you know, initially I was not responsible for training the search team, but I ended up doing that because it was necessary, and I did not research that possibly the way that I should, and that led to, I think, some of the confusion. Also, I've had people from both sides come to me and come to me very emotional about some of the things that are going on. And honestly, I empathize with them and probably didn't do as much calling out behavior and directing behavior as I, as I should have. And then finally, I'm not at all happy the way the business meeting was conducted last Sunday. And I don't know that anybody was necessarily out of line with motions and things like that. You know, we, we have to be able to do that. But I wish there was some way I would have been able to call us back to focus and deal with that in a way that didn't leave uh, people with such a bad taste in their mouth. And I wish that I would have handled that differently. And so, you know, I feel like, you know, I'm constantly doing this self-examination. And a lot of that's my nature as well. I do that with a lot of things. But I think with any conflict that we find ourselves in, and in this conflict, again, 90 to 95% of the people in the church probably are not directly involved in a lot of what's going on. But those, of, those who are, you know, I would really encourage you, or if you're involved with any conflict, I would really encourage you to examine yourself, to examine your thoughts around this, your attitudes, your actions. You know, am I jumping to conclusions? Am I making... Uh, you know, accusations unfairly? Am I, uh, you know, implying motives and intentions on people? Am I trying to make this a contest in which I need to win? You know, those kinds of things. And I, I just think that it's so crucial that we are able to examine ourselves so that we could take responsibility for our part in the conflict. And again, let God worry about our brother and, and his part in the conflict, which leads to actually to the third part of advice that the Corinthians letters give us. And that is to be ministers of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 
chapter 2, uh, verse chapter 5, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And, and of course, I, I understand that they're talking about you know, reconciliation to God and salvation, but I also believe that, that you know, positional righteousness also leads to practical righteousness. The horizontal leads to the vertical. And so, yes, there's reconciliation between us and God, but there's also reconciliation between us and others. And Paul talks a lot about peace and living at peace with one another in the Corinthian letters. 1 Corinthians 7.15, God has called us to live in peace. 2 Corinthians 14.33, God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. 2 Corinthians 13.11, live in peace and the God of love and peace will be with you. And of course we know that, that this was very much a part of the teaching in the heart of Jesus. Where he said, blessed are the peacemakers. Where he, when he was asked, you know, Lord, how often should we forgive our brother? You know, seven times? And Jesus said, no, seven times, 70 times. He said, if you're offering your gift at the altar, which is how they worship. That was their act of worship. If you're offering your gift at the altar, and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there at the altar. Go be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Or Matthew 18. If you know that someone has something against you, go to your brother. Show him his fault. You know, the idea of trying to reconcile. And there's this whole reconciliation process. And of course, there's James, which tells us to confess our sins, to confess our faults to one another. And that's part of what this is. When we're confessing to someone, you know, we're saying, you know, I have wronged you and I want you to forgive me. Now, of course, all of this requires, you know, humility and the idea of, of you know, seeking uh, forgiveness from others. But the point is that this is a biblical imperative. That this is what it means to be spiritual. This is what it means to follow Christ. This is what it means to be the church. And if we're going to be authentic and genuine in our relationship with God and in trying to follow God, we have to do everything we can to keep short accounts with others and short accounts with God. We need to do everything we can to be reconciled to our brother and to live in peace and to be unified in our church family. And so, you know, the question is, well, well, why doesn't this happen? Why, you know, why do we have continued conflict in, in our relationships, in our family, in our world, and yes, even in our churches at times? And it's because of pride and bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness and anger. And I guess my question is, you know, where do all those things come from? Well, I can tell you where they don't come from. You know, they don't come from the Lord. They don't come from a place of yielding to God. They don't come from following the Spirit of God. They're coming from the flesh. And they're coming uh, from a place that actually makes the situation worse. And so the Corinthian church, the great church, man, God is working in and through them in some amazing ways. And Living Stones is just like that. God is working in and through us to do amazing things that are, that are awesome. But they're also a very human church. And they had problems and divisions. Likewise, we're a human church. And we're not immune from those problems and divisions. And so like the Corinthian church, we need to take steps to, to address that. And that is first recognizing that the unity of the body of Christ is the most important thing. And a unity around His mission and His message. Second, that we examine ourselves and take responsibility for our part in what's going on. And then finally, that we become the minister of reconciliation. That we go and we seek out peace. That we are the peacemaker to go and, and bring unity into the body of Christ. And so... As we close, there's, there's a couple of things I want to challenge you to do. I, I so wish we were meeting in person. I really do because there's just so much loss when it's just like on a video and we're not here. If we were in person, I would call everyone to the altar. And I'd call people to go to one another and, and confess and, and seek forgiveness and, and give forgiveness and, and restore those right relationships. And so right now in your home, I want to ask you just to, you know, right now, 
just reflect in your heart that, you know, if you're involved in, in this or another conflict or something, you know, examine your heart. You know, and, and what is my role in all this? Or what, what are some ways I may have contributed to this, even if it wasn't intentional? I don't, I don't think anybody in anything that's gone on in our church was intentional. Everybody wants what's best for the church. Everybody's trying to do the right thing. But we're human, and we make mistakes. And so, you know, where have we possibly made mistakes, and where do we need to go and seek forgiveness? The second thing that I want to challenge us is that, you know, I don't think that we really need to have this business meeting that was scheduled last week for next week. I'm just not a fan of the, the online, and I don't really think it's time. I think we need to step back, take a breath, and I think there's some healing that needs to go on. And I don't know exactly every way about how the church needs to move forward, but there's so many different things up in the air. We have this COVID-19 thing going on and, you know, uh, and, and just, you know, Ryan is, is going to be leaving and, and going, so we're losing staff and just, just, there's just stuff that's going on, a lot of uncertainty in the church. And I want you to know that, that myself and Randy have been meeting quite a bit this week. We met once for about three and a half hours. We met for two hours at, at a later time to try to find a way through this where we all come together and where the church can fulfill the greatness that God wants for it. And as awesome as our church is now, I believe it can be even better. But the only way that happens is if we're unified. And so please allow us to try and find a way through this and, and present something to the church that honors Christ and, and, and expresses His righteousness and His direction and His mission in, in every way. And so with all of that, that said, again, um, Livingstone is a great church. And I think all of us love this church. And I think that's why emotions get so high is because we don't want to lose this. And I totally concur with everything that people think about that. And so, you know, what do we need to do? Well, we need to get our eyes fixed on Christ and where He wants us to go. And we need to submit and yield to Him in the ways that He wants us to submit and to yield. And so, as we dismiss, uh, I would like to go ahead and pray. Father, God, we come to You with in a sense, uh, uh, heavy hearts because there's some brokenness between some individuals in our church. Uh, some of the processes haven't worked the way that they're supposed to. There's frustration. There's confusion. And Father, I pray first and foremost for those of us who are leaders in the church that, God, you would help us to navigate those things in a way that honors you and is right and does right by everybody in the church. God, I want to pray for the individual members of our church. God, I want to pray that we be a unified body. If there's anyone that needs to seek out reconciliation with another and make peace with another, to confess sins, to offer forgiveness, Lord, I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would drive that process. That, God, those people would not rest. That, God, you would afflict them, Lord, with a restlessness until, Lord, that unity is achieved. And Father, I just pray for our church going forward. I pray that we would be every bit the church that you want us to be. And I know that starts spiritually. And spiritually starts with our unity. It starts with the nature of our community, our fellowship. And so God, help us to be a fellowship that honors you, that brings glory to you in every way, shape, or form. So Father, I I ask that you just hear these things and, God, be with our church. Give us courage in these times. Give us humility. God, give us grace. Give us mercy in these times. And, Father, we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we close, I just, just have a couple of announcements I want to share. And the first one is that we have a lot going on, a lot more that I'm able to talk about. And so please pay attention to your email and for the email blasts that come out, they'll tell you all about our Bible studies and you know, youth group and all that sort of stuff. But I do want to pray that tonight, if you're watching this on Sunday, <laughs> uh, that tonight we are having Pray With Me. 
and that's at 6 o'clock, and be watching for the email about how to connect with Pray With Me. And so I hope that you will be there, and myself and Randy and the deacons and other people will be there, and we will be praying for our church, praying for one another, praying for the needs in our church. And right now, I think that is, as always, actually the best thing that we could be doing. Thank you so much, and I hope to see you again.